My name is Trevor Miller. I'm one of our solutions architects, uh, specifically when uh, within our voice and, and conferencing practice. Um, I've been with Proficient a while, been involved with lots of things in the Microsoft UC space all the way back to uh, Office Communication Server 2007. So we're officially 13, 13 years in at this point. But uh, what I want to talk about today, uh, let me get my screen share up and going and we'll fire away. I've got um, a bunch of content to go over, but I, I want to focus explicitly on the meetings and calling experience in Teams. Uh, some of you may be coming from environments that uh, maybe you're transitioning off of Skype for Business or maybe you're starting Greenfield and you would be using Teams uh, without any any of the legacy Microsoft UC products. But um, got a lot of stuff to go through, so I'm not going to waste too much time on intros and, and just kind of uh, kind of dig in. So here we go. Um, so first and foremost, looking at, um, you know, just an intro to Teams meetings, I, I actually pulled this slide, oddly enough, from a deck that Microsoft had from about a year ago. And at that time, you, you know, Microsoft was noticing, and indeed the industry as a whole, the, the, the needs for meetings are changing. People are more remote, um, they're more virtual, they're joining on mobile devices, and, and video is definitely a, a big increase in that. And I wanted to show this slide because it was actually a little funny because where we are today, you know, COVID has unilaterally rewrote these statistics for the past, you know, four or five months. Many of us have been completely doing this 100% from home. So it has truly changed the landscape. And, and I don't know if that was just a fortuitous prediction by Microsoft, but everybody is working remote and, and we're not in offices uh, currently anyway. Um, so we have, people have had to adjust to the, the new nature of the business in which we operate and the way in which we collaborate. Um, that being said, even before COVID came along, you, you could probably ask yourself this question, how effective are your meetings? You know, you probably had technical difficulties when you're joining conferences from in, in conference rooms, or if you're trying to include external remote participants, maybe it's a business partner or, or maybe it's something like this where, um, you know, we have guests joining our meeting. Um, you know, what kind of capabilities are do the tools that you're using provide those people? Um, and then you have scenarios where maybe meetings, the context of the meetings is not understood uh, before or after the meetings. So it, it often results in you know non-effective meetings because you rehash the same things over and over and you have to meet more than, than you have to. So one of the goals that, that Microsoft is really trying to do uh, in the meeting space is to to try and hone in and optimize that meeting experience. So a, a couple reasons why um, in, in my mind, I would say Teams is at the top of the list of, of things that you really should be considering. Um, first and foremost, you do have a consistent user experience across pretty much all of the end user applications. That includes the desktop client, uh, the mobile client, the web client, and um, there are some meeting room capabilities as well. It the the UI is largely the same. There are some differences when you're only using the web browser version, but by and far, you have a very similar experience with whatever device that you are using. Uh, above and beyond that, you, you can have high quality meetings that scale from anything small like two users all the way up to 10,000 or even now in COVID, 20,000 attendees. Uh, so you can you can handle meetings that on-premises meeting solutions, especially in the Skype for Business days, just never would be able to to scale that large. So you can you can go from small all the way to big, and as a part of that meeting experience, you can offer audio conferencing. So the ability to dial in and dial out, uh, it's currently available in 90 countries uh, for dial in and then dial out to uh, 190 plus. Um, but that is a capability that, that you can get in, in, in the product. And then on top of that, you have all of the Microsoft 365 security and compliance functionality, things like data loss prevention, uh, things like insider risk compliance, um, retention policies, all, all of that capability around compliance and then things with Intune and endpoint management to provide security around the devices that are connecting to the team's infrastructure 
are at your fingertips if you choose to use them. Uh, and then lastly, the fifth one, we'll focus on this a bit more um, in later on in the deck, but it, it really is when you're using a quote unquote, what Microsoft calls a Teams room system, there is a less frictioned join experience for actually getting into meetings and getting work done. And that's that's the exact scenario that Microsoft was trying to design for was to provide one touch join and you join the meeting and away you go and you do your stuff and then you walk away and uh, and you don't have to think about it. Um, so those are probably my top five that I'll look at. Um, that being said, what, what I want to focus on a little bit are some of the changes that have uh, have come in the service just this year or looking at things that are coming in the future. And as Joel was mentioning earlier, you know, things are coming fast and heavy um, as a result of just the the cadence of rollout in the cloud in general, but also because of COVID. Um, so we've had a lot of features that have come to the meeting experience since the beginning of 2020. And these are some of them. A, a couple that I do want to point out. Um, first, the blur background. Um, there is actually an admin policy setting in there that you can use to control what backgrounds people use. Um, there have been some instances of people, you know, maybe putting less than less than ideal backgrounds there. Um, so maybe you want to restrict it to blur only and, and you block any kind of background upload as well. That is something that um, that will be in the in the Teams Admin Center policy settings or available by PowerShell. Um, video support for the nine active video streams. That was something that kind of came along early in the year and then that has since been transposed and uh, supplanted by the new meeting experience, which is beginning to roll out, I'll, I'll cover that, but you effectively have your large video feeds with up to 49 users on a, on a single screen. Uh, meeting attendance reports. So this is something that was a big ask from the education side of the house because when teachers were having um, instructional lessons, they needed to have a, a, a roster report of who attended, how long they stayed, when they left, et cetera. Um, so that is something that is, is rolled out in, in tenants as well. End meeting support is another really, really big one that was that was missing for a while. The, the ability to basically end a meeting and boot everybody out, um, that is now available for most tenants. The presenter role configuration, so at a tenant level, you can specify whether just internal employees or presenters um, or if you allow external uh, external parties to be presenters as well, that can be set at the tenant level instead of I, the end user, um, configuring it as a part of my meeting experience. Raise hand was another big one. Uh, that was another ask coming from the education world to, to allow a hand to be raised. To, don't you have a question? And then lastly, some of the meeting join launcher. Um, so when you click on the join meeting link and it launches a browser, there's a different user interface there that allows you to select how you join the meeting experience, whether it's by the desktop client or the web client. Um, so that has begun to roll out as well. Looking at future innovations, a couple things that I'll kind of point out in here. There's, um, if you are a governmental customer, there's a lot of things that are available in what Microsoft calls the shared commercial cloud. So that's where most organizations exist in the Office 365 world. Um, a lot of those enhancements have not made it to the government clouds yet. They will, it's just the government cloud tends to run a little bit behind of what the commercial cloud does. So a, a couple ones that I'll point out here that are hugely important. Um, Multi-window for meetings, that was just recently announced. It is actually available uh, to proficient in our own tenant as of uh, roughly about a week ago. So that is a huge uh, advantage for us because we do have calls where we have more than nine people that are sharing video feed. Um, Windows virtual desktop support. So if you are a Citrix customer today, there is some capabilities that Citrix provides in conjunction with support from Microsoft to more optimize the experience for Citrix VDI endpoints. Microsoft is now taking some of the same functionality and beginning it to roll it into Windows virtual desktops that are hosted on Azure. So that same capability of enhancing the audio, video, and meeting experience for virtual de desktops in Azure um, will be coming as well. 
Um, Teams Room System native WebEx interop and native Zoom interop. We'll, I'll talk a little bit about this um, further in the deck, but it's effectively the ability of, if you are using a Teams Room System in a conference room, the ability to natively join a WebEx meeting or a Zoom meeting directly from that Teams conference room system. Uh, today, there really is no join capability outside of you just call in, you, you dial the PSTN number. Um, those are future enhancements. The WebEx piece actually just got released for the room system capability, I believe uh, maybe a week or two ago. So that is coming fast and furious as well. Um, video support, we talked about that. We know we're at 49 now. Um, and then the last one, the IT admin policy control. This is the capability of um, at the tenant level setting saying that if a meeting has um, been conducted, like today's meeting, for instance, uh, you can basically provide a configuration that says nobody can rejoin that meeting after a specified day and time. Um, this is also something that comes from the educational space, but does have some value for the corporate space as well. And it's primarily around just preventing people from going back into meetings um, when when they have been ended and, and closed uh, to keep people from going back in and possibly getting content or um, just being in there and not needing to be there. So all that being said, there is a lot of stuff that I did not cover here. This I created this about a month ago. Um, so again, a lot of it has been updated, but the 365 roadmap is a good place to see what is out there. Uh, that Microsoft has made public. And of course, there are, there are things that is not on the roadmap that Microsoft still has cooking in the hopper that um, is hey, not One right. quick question for you that came through the chat, Trevor. Yeah. Um, is about uh, just talking about classroom features, education-based features. Mm -hmm. And there was a question about breakouts. I know there's some stuff on the roadmap, but I don't know if you want to speak to that. Yeah, breakouts, I, I'm... Not sure if they are public yet, but individual breakout rooms, that is something that is on the roadmap. Um, I believe it is primarily targeted explicitly for education customers first and then commercial second, but I don't think it's been fully released yet. But I do know that's a roadmap item. Good question though. Yeah, um, yep. By the way, feel free anybody who does have questions to just if you want to have us ask them for you, feel free to top, type them in the in the chat window. Yep, absolutely. Um, so in talking about meetings, um, one of the things that you need to understand is that there are really four different sets of meeting types within Teams. Um, private meetings, channel meetings, there are what what's known as meet now meetings, and then live events. Private meetings are, are most likely the most familiar for pretty much everybody on the call. You, you use Outlook to create a meeting invite. There's a plugin that adds the meeting info to the meeting invite. You send it out to people and only they are the ones that, that effectively know about it. Um, that's pretty much the, the bare minimum for, for most collaboration tools today, Teams included, Skype was the same, Zoom, WebEx, that they all have a Outlook related plugin. Um, you can, though, also schedule a private meeting through the um, through Outlook Web App, also through the Find Time service in Office 365, and through the little calendar app icon located directly in Teams. Private meetings, you set who receives the invite, and thus they are private, and then only the people have access to it for those who are on the invite list. Channel meetings are a little bit different. Channel meetings are a meeting that is scheduled directly within a team channel. Uh, and the difference there is, the assumption is when you create it in the channel, the meeting is meant to be attended by everybody in the channel. Thus, it's visible to everybody in the channel and all of the information associated with the meeting are available via, via the channel. So any chats you have, any notes, any files, et cetera, they, they remain in place within um, within the channel. Channel meetings can only be scheduled through the calendar app within Teams, and you can do it um, on the mobile client or on the desktop or web client. Um, channel meetings are great for scenarios where uh, you have continuously rotating membership 
of say a project. So um, one weakness with private meetings is you always have to keep the Outlook invites up to date as people may leave a project or join a project. Channel meetings, because it's all based off of the team membership and the channel membership, the system automatically keeps up to date. So if somebody is removed from the team, the, the meeting service within the cloud automatically takes them off of the meeting invite and sends out an update on, on their behalf. So does have some uh, really handy uses. Meet Now is effectively just an ad hoc reservationless way to, to create a meeting. Um, you can do it by escalating an, an existing chat that you may have with someone in Teams, or maybe you're chatting with someone in a channel. There is actually a Meet Now button in there, but it's basically a way to take a, a very ad hoc approach to escalating a conversation to a meeting. Um, they are effectively would be very similar to what you would see with a private meeting once once you're in there. Um, it's only available to the people that you request as a part of creation of the, the Meet Now meeting. So you create it, then you say, these are the people I want to add, um, et cetera. And then you've got live events. So live events are um, really the formal webinar based type, the one to many IT town hall, HR uh, benefits kind of presentations, uh, really meant for a, a structured one to many. Uh, and it is a more formal and produced kind of meeting invitation and, and meeting experience. Again, only available in the calendar app within Teams. There is actually a little drop down in there where you can say new live event. Um, but live events are really meant for a, a formal kind of produced meeting type. Um, so when you look at, you know, do I, especially for regular meetings and live events, when you look at whether or not you should use one or the other, um, Joel had created this pretty handy slide and it's, it's a decent comparison of when to use. Um, what we're doing today is more on the left-hand side. It, it's interactive, collaborative, relatively simple. Um, you can have a maximum of 300 attendees and there's minimums around uh, what the roles are within the meeting. Live events, on the other hand, um, it, it, is a, it is a structured approach where you have different roles. You have uh, an organizer, the person who creates the meeting. You have a producer, that, that's the one who is actually controlling what content is being showed and the mixing. And then you have speakers who are doing the speaking, like that would be myself, Ron, Eric, et cetera, and then attendees, and that would be you guys. Um, but there's a very structured approach to it. The advantage with live events is also that you can you can connect to external media coders. Uh, so similar to how if you watch like CNN or MSNBC or Fox when they have people joining um, interviews via Skype or some nature of that, it, it's very much the same experience where that external media coder allows you to bring in video feeds and audio feeds and content feeds from outside of just the PC related world. So what this kind of looks like from a live event architecture is, so you have the organizer, they're the one that schedules it. And there's multiple places where you can schedule live events. Um, primarily we'll focus on Teams, but there is the capability to do it in Stream and Yammer as well. And then you have the producer. So the, the person who is um, controlling the audio video feeds, maybe you're doing that natively through the Teams app. On the bottom is a sample where you're actually using a separate hardware encoder from one of the vendors there, um, such as OBS Studio, where maybe you're uh, bringing in an HDMI feed from a very expensive Sony or Panasonic video camera. Um, that, that could be something that would be, uh, would be applicable there. And then the producer decides to go live, and as soon as you go live, that content is then sent to Azure Media Services because live events are hosted within the Azure realm. And if you are using third-party content delivery systems such as Hive or Collective or Ramp, um, those services can tap into the Azure Media Services feeds and ultimately reduce the bandwidth on your network for the people who go to view your meetings. Otherwise, you just view it from uh, a browser and it's just as uh, similar as to what we do today, uh, but that's the live event architecture. So given that everything in the Teams world is, is really wrapped around um, media processing and how it's controlled by Azure, 
one of the things you really have to think about and, and kind of know about is that there are specific media processing locations that Teams uses for all of these meeting, the different meeting types. Um, Teams is a service that sits on top of Azure. It is built on Azure as an Azure service and the Azure Intelligent Edge. With that being said, you've got primarily three different geographic regions that Microsoft processes media for Teams meetings. Um, this will only really be uh, applicable for organizations that may have uh, multi-geography kind of footprints, but um, in America, it's East Coast and West Coast, so California and Virginia. In Europe, it's Dublin and Amsterdam, and then in Asia Pac, it's Hong Kong and Singapore. So, for instance, if you are a U.S.-based company, your U.S.-based, you have a U.S.-based tenant, pretty much all your stuff is going to happen um, within one of these two data centers based off of where your users are. That being said, there are some additional locations that Microsoft has for specific data residency scenarios and growth of the team service. And, and those are on the screen. I won't go through them all, but that list is ever growing uh, to provide improved media services and then uh, specific regulatory data residency, residency scenarios where uh, you need to ensure that content is not outside of the country. So for example, the Canadian government there is there are data centers for Toronto and Quebec that provide data residency explicitly for uh, customers located in Cal uh, California in uh, Canada. And that is the same kind of scenario that you will see across the globe. This list is ever expanding. Um, and as it expands, they all get connected via the Microsoft Global Network. So this is the network that your traffic, when it leaves your corporate network, hops onto and then rides to reach the media processing um, servers that are located within Azure. Microsoft spends a lot of time and a lot of money trying to make the global network as, as robust and uh, high performing as possible. And it's because of that network that you can pretty much have, even on remote cell phones, you can have a fairly good experience in conjunction with some of the codec capabilities that exist in the product. So. All that being said, I, I want to focus a little bit on uh, just a couple things around meeting media flows to, to help you understand why, um, why it is important to design your network right. Um, in general, meetings typically just work. Uh, there is a meeting service in the cloud. That service is responsible for taking all of the audio video feeds from all the attendees, mixing it, and then sending it out to all the, the endpoints. And as I said, uh, before, your tenant location is the primary determinator for where the meeting service decides to, to anchor those media flows. There is an exception there. I'm going to go into that on the next slide, but um, for the purposes of this slide, just assume for a moment that you're a U.S.-based tenant and a user in Chicago scheduled a meeting, clicked the join meeting, the join meeting button five minutes to the top of the hour, and what the meeting service does is it looks at the traffic coming from that user, determines where they are by a geo IP lookup, and starts the meeting in the geographically closest Azure data center to that user. So for this particular use case, that's the Azure data center in Virginia. So when all of the rest of the users click the join meeting link, that means all of their traffic goes to the same data center in Virginia, and it goes back and forth. Um, the way that all of your remote users get to the Azure Data Center is going to be different because each user may have a different ISP and it may route differently, but effectively that is the traffic flow that that traffic would take for this particular scenario. Now the exception to this scenario is if someone from a non-US location decides to join that meeting, say one minute before anybody else, and that's the exception media flow. So you'll see I've kind of mapped the graph out there, or the graph, the uh, world map out there. And we've got a user that is actually located in Europe now, specifically in France. So what ends up happening in this particular scenario is the same the same uh, structure applies, but the, the user in France is the first one to join. What ends up happening is that the meeting service actually homes that meeting 
in the Azure data center located in Ireland as a result. So when all of your US-based users go to join, their traffic is now going all the way across the Atlantic um, to the Azure data center there and then coming back to them. So you may see a little bit of latency, more latency involved there because the traffic has, has further to go, but this is an expected scenario. Um, so especially for geographically diverse customers, allowing your traffic to get onto the Microsoft network as quickly as possible becomes a huge performance improvement because this traffic goes across the Microsoft network and it's optimized. Um, so definitely something that uh, that you want to make sure is in place for geographically remote uh, deployments. So moving on, um, taking a little look at audio conferencing pieces of this. Um, audio conferencing, first and foremost, commercially available in roughly 72 countries. What that really means is if your tenant is in is homed in one of those 72 countries, you're you're able to purchase the licenses for audio conferencing. And assuming that is the case, you have roughly 90 countries and 400 cities that you have available to use for dial in capabilities. You punch in the number and, and dial the number um, all across the world. Dial out capabilities, so having the bridge call you there's there's a little bit wider support there. Um, Microsoft does support more 190 plus countries, uh, but you do have the capability for dial in and dial out. Dial in capabilities, just a, a note to make there is it may be told or toll free numbers. The toll free numbers are very dependent based upon the location you are are trying to request the number for. So it may you may not be able to have toll free numbers everywhere for instance, and you may have to have just regular toll numbers. And lastly, interactive voice response. So they've got 44 languages and dialects for some of the various dialects across the globe. Uh, I haven't heard of anybody really complaining that uh, a particular language is not there. But if you are a multi geographic organization, chances are one of the, the languages will be there. And the IVRs again are all hosted and processed by Azure. So as the Azure services grow and add additional dialects, that list will get large will get larger as well. Um, and lastly, if uh, when you get the deck uh, after the completion of today's today's call, um, the hyperlink there for the countries list, you can always go out and check what the the latest list is. Um, it is growing. I'm sure my deck is out of date by this point, but it has a per country and per region list if you are um, really needing to know. So that's really audio conferencing. Audio conferencing is fairly straightforward. It's really just licensing based. And when, when you're assigned uh, the license, you can do exactly what we do today uh, on this particular meeting. And if you need to dial in, you can. Um, so some of you may, may be thinking, well, OK, when, when COVID you know, kind of goes to the wayside, we are actually able to, to come back to the buildings and resume normal work. What do, we, what do we do about the conference rooms that we have? And in some cases, these conference rooms may be very simple. Maybe it's a, a small huddle room, or, or in other cases, it may be small, medium, large size, or you know, extra large with uh, training room capabilities. Um, and what Microsoft has available is, a, is a, set of, a set of solutions called Teams Room Systems. And it's really aimed at bringing the feature set specifically from Teams and the one touch join and the, and the simplicity of the solution onto a conference ready appliance that you can have in the conference room to make your lives easier when it comes to you know, really joining meetings. The big thing to understand though is that not all conference rooms are created equal and it's not just a size problem. Um, some of the problems that you're gonna run into are related to things like the acoustics of the room. Uh, there's one organization that I worked with a few years ago that their conference room walls were all made out of glass. And as a result of that, the echo in the conference rooms was simply unbearable because glass is very hard. It's a reflective service and there wasn't enough furniture in the conference rooms to dampen the effect of uh, the effect of the echo. So it became a real a real big impediment for conference calls because you always heard your echo uh, when you were talking on conference calls. 
Uh, likewise, things around camera placement and, and cable management. Um, you know, if you have a, a conference room that's a larger media size, where does the control system go? Does it go on the table? Does it need to be on the wall? How do we hide the cables? How do we get cables to the the cameras and, and what is the field of view for cameras? Does it need to be wide because the room is wide or does it need to be narrow because we only want to see the table in front of us? Um, additional questions to think about and, and lastly lighting. Um, you know, if, if you don't have sufficient lighting, the, the cameras will have trouble um, showing the picture and and things will look grainy and, and it'll look the, the picture to the remote people will look kind of poor. So these are some of the things that uh, we work with a, a third party conference room uh, provider called VSGI. Um, we partner with them and they actually do um, qualifications of rooms and, and look at these capabilities based off of the room size and the qualifications and the needs and, and come up with uh, solutions to minimize the effects of some of the negative features of the conference rooms and provide you a, a good solution. But all that being said, you've got many different sizes and many different uh, avenues to explore when it comes to conference rooms for putting those uh, Teams room systems into them. Maybe on the left hand side here, you know, this kind of shows the less formal to more formal going from left to right. Uh, so on the left hand side, it may be uh, something small like a huddle area or maybe a communal area that's in a, you know, a shared break room area on the floor. And then you start to get into, you know, dedicated rooms and spaces like huddle rooms that may just have a phone number or maybe it's a huddle room with a display and four chairs and then, and then move on and up from there. Um, some of these solutions are going to be Microsoft first party, like you've got things around like the Surface Hub 2 or uh, some of the Windows collaboration displays. And then you begin to move into some of the partner based solutions from uh, customers like Crestron or HP or Polycom or Lenovo, Logitech and Yealink. They all have various different sets of solutions to uh, to maximize what you need for the space of the room and the requirements of some of the audio video uh, capabilities. So you've got definitely a lot of solutions to choose from, and I haven't even really demoed or, or mentioned uh, some of the new collaboration bars functionality. But again, those those pieces of technology, they still come from these existing partner room solutions, so we can as as you get to that point, you can d dive into exactly what type of solutions that you think you may need. Um, what I wanted to at least show you is um, I don't have an actual solution here with me, but at least a demo of what this may look like if you are in a conference room with a Teams room system. So I've got a little bit of a mock up here, um, and this is basically what it looks like. So imagine yourself sitting in a conference room you've got an LCD screen on one wall with your camera, um, maybe at the top or maybe at the bottom. The touch screen console is sitting on the table and you've got computer plugins for HDMI or maybe uh, DVI or whatever the case may be on the table. And imagine one of those little round pucks that's sitting on the table as well. That's your audio device. And then the console there, which is where you control everything. So in this particular scenario, just imagine that the conference room is booked from say, you know, 12 to one. You've got two people that come in. Um, the gentleman on the right has his laptop and he's got content on there that he wants to display. The way the room system works is when you take that HDMI device and plug it in, the very first thing that happens is it automatically turns on content display for the screen and it displays it. And now you're not in a meeting yet, but it automatically turns it on for the room so that if you did need to display something and you didn't need to actually join a Teams meeting, you still have the capability to show content. But in this case, we have a meeting to join. So there is a one touch meeting button on the panel that's associated with the meeting for the block of time that uh, that you have the room. You click join and you are automatically added into the meeting and the content is automatically presented. Video turns on, audio turns on, you conduct your meeting, whatever you need to talk about, you show everything you need to show, and then assume for a moment, okay, we're done showing the content. We unplug it. The room system automatically turns off content sharing and resumes the video feed to, um, to what you see there. 
The one thing that I will point out, um, if you are a customer that's looking at room systems, the current nine by nine or um, 49 person video feed is not currently available on the room systems yet. It is coming. They just haven't updated the client software for the room systems to support it yet. Uh, but otherwise, after the meeting is done and, and everybody on the remote has, has hung up, you press the end meeting button and the room system goes back to its ambient display and you are free to leave the room. Life is good. Hey, Trevor, quick question. Yep. Um, from Adam Raymond. Uh, from content from a, sorry, for content from a device, does it have to be hardwired or is there, you know, wireless functionality as far as networking goes? Currently hardwired, they are looking at uh, bringing Miracast based functionality. So wireless based uh, functionality, that is something that will be coming in the future, but currently hardwired. Got it, Adam says thank you. Yep. Um, so for customers that have existing Rune systems, which is probably a whole lot of you, um, you, you may ask, okay, well, do I really have to replace everything in my in my conference rooms in order to to you know have a Teams meeting experience? And the short answer to that is no. Um, the more complex answer to that is there is a solution called Cloud Video Interop. And, and it is a service that's offered by several different partners of Microsoft, one of them being BlueJeans, uh, another being PECTSIP, and the third being Poly, which allows standards-based video conferencing platforms like Cisco or Tanberg or LifeSize or, uh, or Polycom to join a meeting that is technically hosted on the team's infrastructure. Um, you'll actually notice in the meeting invite from today for our meeting here, there is a, a little block of text just below the, the join teams meeting that shows join from a video conferencing device. We internally are using the solution from Polycom uh, and, and that is exactly what the solution is. So if you have a Polycom system, you would enter the digits on the touchpad, call that, punch in the conference ID and you are seamlessly bridged into uh, the Teams meeting by way of the, the hosted Polycom cloud video interop. Uh, so while we are using Poly internally, um, we work with, uh, from a partner perspective, we, we work with a, co a company called Pexip, which effectively has the same kind of structure. Um, the advantage of Pexip though, is that they have uh, three different, really three different deployment scenarios that you can use to actually host the solution. Um, one of those is software as a service completely. You simply purchase it from Pexip. There's no equipment required on premises and you simply consume it from their public SaaS solution. Another version is Azure self-hosted. So you have your own Azure instance and you choose to put these Pexip Infinity nodes within your Azure environment and then you connect to it and interconnect it with the public teams infrastructure. And lastly, there is a hybrid solution. So uh, if you are a Skype for Business customer today, you may have Pexip installed on premises for some integration aspects with you know, Cisco or Tamburg or whatever the case may be. Um, that hybrid solution also can, can be deployed on prem for scenarios where it is required. But the most simplistic is the software as a service. You simply purchase it from Pexip. They run it on your behalf, um, just as you, you purchase services from Microsoft for Office 365. But you still support all the wide range of devices that you need to. The, the scheduling and joining experience is very much like what we have today. Um, and desktop and application sharing is supported in there. So that is definitely a, a solution that we can talk with you guys about um, and, and PECSEP would be uh, a good fit for that. So some of you may ask, well, what, what about non-Microsoft meetings? I am a, a healthcare customer and all of the business partners that I work with, they use WebEx. And I need to be able to integrate with WebEx for meetings that they host. Right now, I just have to call in 
and I can't see desktop share. I have to look at a laptop on my screen, et cetera, and it's kind of a pain. So one of the things that is coming is the capability to have native WebEx and Zoom integration on the Teams room systems. And really what this means is those third-party applications will be bundled directly into the Teams room system platform. So the Cisco WebEx uh, app will be directly on the room system as will the Zoom system. Um, as an aside, these room systems run Windows 10. It, it's Windows 10 IoT edition. So really, anything that can run on IoT uh, is technically available from a theoretical perspective to be run on the Teams room systems. But what this will give you, once, once Microsoft has embedded the code and, and made it available, is really the one touch capability so that if someone has sent a, a Zoom or a WebEx invite and you get the room and, and you forward that to the room, you will see one touch meeting join directly on the room system console for non-Microsoft based meetings. This is the ultimate goal. Um, so this is, this capability is completely independent of the cloud video interop capability. So two separate pieces. Uh, this is really about joining non-Teams meetings from your, your room system endpoint, where the other is bringing in, say, a Cisco endpoint into a Teams meeting. A uh, little bit different use case, but this is really the future. Um, the WebEx capability was just recently enabled in the most recent version of the Teams room system software and capabilities. So if you are running these today, once you get the update, you will actually see if you uh, forward a meeting invite to the conference room, you will see the one touch meeting join show up there as a result. So this is really the future of supporting non-Microsoft meetings from the Microsoft Teams room system devices. So that is all meetings related. Uh, the other thing that I wanna talk to you a bit about is, is the calling aspect. So really Teams as a phone. And, and, and this is in the Skype for Business days, Microsoft would call this enterprise voice. Um, it, it's still largely, you can refer to it as enterprise voice today, but it's really the ability of using Teams as, as your primary phone endpoint. Now, the dial pad and everything you're seeing here is the, is the PC user interface. There are IP phone based devices that you can use with Teams. I'm not gonna focus too much on that, but you get all the core pieces of functionality that, that one would expect from a, a, a PBX or a private branch exchange, which otherwise is known as a phone system. Um, you get your phone lines, you, you get transfer, voicemail, delegation, uh, some of the more advanced features we'll, we'll talk about later, and those are auto attendance and call queues, things for automating call routing in the Teams platform as a service. Um, and then you have things around some of the emergency and compliance aspects around location-based routing and E911 that Microsoft provides you at, as well. But largely speaking, you can use Teams as your phone. Uh, I, I have many customers that have done it. Um, so it is a capability that you could use if you so choose to. And the, one of the things to understand about how Microsoft has structured for Teams is it, it is a sum of its parts. So at its core, you have Office 365, and then Microsoft Teams, of which is a portion of the modern workplace functionality. To get the phone system functionality, you need a couple additional pieces in order to make that make it active. One of which is the PBX functionality, which is referred to as phone system. So Teams cooperates with phone system, but phone system is a separate purchased license for certain licensing SKUs uh, in the Office 365 space. Once you've got phone system, then you need to have what's referred to as dial tone, which is basically the ability to get a phone number and to make a phone call. Uh, and those are available in two primary forms, Microsoft calling plans and direct routing. And when you look at all of them holistically, you can use one, the other, or both of the PSTN dial tone capabilities to actually provide full calling experiences for anybody across the globe, regardless of, of where they are geographically. Um, the calling plans piece is by far the most simplistic. It is, um, it is analogous to getting a, a, 
a cell phone line from a, a cell phone carrier. You, you get a, a cell phone and a phone from Verizon and Verizon is your carrier and you simply make calls through that, that service. That is very similar to how calling plans operates. Microsoft has availability for this service in several countries across the globe. Um, Canada, US, Puerto Rico, some locations in, in Europe. Um, and then they partner with some third party orgs in Asia Pac, so namely Telstra and SoftBank in, in Japan. But these, this service, you can request a phone number in minutes and a brand new phone number that is requested in minutes, assign it to user accounts and away you go. The, there's no equipment required on premises uh, outside of an audio device and a PC. And that's it. Um, if you need to port your existing phone number, so say for instance, you're an Avaya customer and you want to turn off your Avaya phone system, but you want to keep your public telephone numbers. You can take those numbers and potentially port them to Microsoft service and then basically use them within the calling plans service uh, in the cloud. There are some limits around what countries you can port numbers from. Uh, it's primarily the UK and the US, so unfortunately it's not available all around the globe. Uh, but for those two scenarios, you can basically take your phone numbers with you if you so choose. Uh, in addition to that, there's a bunch of E911 capabilities that are included in the platform. I'll cover those uh, a, a bit lately, uh, a bit later, excuse me. And then lastly, you do have the choice of whether you only allow domestic or, or domestic and international calling for any user that you provision for calling plans. That is absolutely uh, a capability that is, uh, exists today. So if you only need to call local US numbers, you don't need to assign an international calling plan if you don't need to, you make the choice. Um, with that being said, calling plans, like I said, is the most simple. However, you'll notice there's a lot of white area on that map. You may have uh, users that are located in say Central America or South America, maybe Africa or locations in the Middle East, uh, Russia, India, Asia Pac, you can't get a phone number there. So the alternative to this is a solution called direct routing, which is it, it's based off of having a hardware appliance called a session border controller that is installed either in your data center or at your office location. And that piece of hardware basically interconnects with your your existing voice trunks with all of your voice providers, maybe it's BT or Verizon or AT&T or British uh, or Tata or whatever the case may be. And that system allows you to take teams and connect your existing voice phone numbers to them in the locations where calling plans may not be available. You can choose to do this on a self-hosted basis. You buy the hardware, you stick it in your data centers, you stick it in your offices, or there are a number of different solutions out there that you can have third party hosted where uh, it's hosted at a remote data center and you just connect to it over the WAN. But at the end of the day, you continue to get phone service through your on-premises phone providers, but you're using Teams to make those calls through the, the session border controller with direct routing. And some of the additional benefits with this particular approach are now you can directly connect to third party phone systems like Cisco or Avaya. Uh, because it's controlled directly through the session border controller, you can make interconnections to those systems and route calls internally. Additionally, you can have things like call centers or analog phones that are connected to that session border controller that allows your team's clients to make a phone call, say to a call center workflow without requiring them to go through the public telephone number for the call center. Uh, and lastly, there is some OPEX costs that you do save uh, because direct routing does not require uh, some of the calling plan licensing structure. I'll go over that later and I'll kind of demo, uh, show you what that looks like. There is a little bit of cost reduction on an on a OPEX basis because you don't have to pay for those, those monthly licenses. So direct routing, uh, and calling plans, the, the two primary methodologies there. Uh, looking specifically at the hosted direct routing architecture though, this is where we see a lot of customers going. Um, 
there may be specific requirements that they can't use calling plans. So they want to use direct routing, but they don't want to put the equipment on premises. They don't want anything in the data centers. They want it to be all cloud-based. Um, so this is an option. Now that third-party data center, it could be Azure. It could be uh, British Telecom has a hosted solution, as does Verizon. Uh, or it could be a, another provider that, that simply has their own data centers, but they interconnect with your MPLS network. At the end of the day, it, it's the same features and functionality. It's just you are moving the location of the session border controller to an, another provider. They handle all of the uptime and configuration and maintenance for it, but it still connects directly to your Office 365 tenant. Additionally, if you are a company that, say, has multiple business units that are logically separated from themselves, you could potentially look at being a hoster yourselves, hosting a, a direct routing SBC and interconnecting it with multiple different Office 365 tenants, or maybe you would potentially purchase a service from, from somewhere else, uh, from someone else. Um, but the third-party solution, it is very much viable. Definitely something that we see a lot of a lot of customers going to, uh, because they want to reduce the the reliance of equipment within the data centers and push it out to the cloud. So, talking a little bit about advanced call routing, uh, I want to focus a little bit on auto attendance and call queues because um, they are a use case that is presence that is present in solutions today. Um, auto attendance are really when you call into a main number. You, you get a multi-level kind of um, DTMF capability, press one for this, press two for this, four for this, et cetera. You have business hours configured on it, uh, you know, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then outside of that, it goes to a different menu. Um, there's a lot of configuration in there that you can place. And then call queues are really analogous to in the old telco world, we call them hunt groups. Just the way to route calls to a specific group of people um, in, in a structured approach. And where this starts to come in is, is you can piecemeal and add the two parts together. So what I've actually kind of created here is sort of a fictitious call flow of if you call my main number during business hours, you're going to hear greeting and then you're going to get some menu options. Maybe you want to go to the operator. Maybe you just need to know where my location is or maybe you need to access, uh, contact the HR department or the service desk department. And then each of those options actually goes to a call queue. And the call queue itself controls some of the routing logic. How do I alert the users that a call is coming in? Is it a specific order that would be known as serial? Or is it round robin where it just kind of bounces around from you know, the first user, then the second user, then the third, and, and it goes in round robin order? Or attendant, which is basically just a blast. Everybody gets it, regardless of whether at their desk or not. And then Within the call keys, you have something called an agent group, and that's really the users that receive your calls. And those users, no surprise, are people using Teams. So for instance, if I were to actually call in and it's during business hours, those calls could automatically route to any of those various call queues and users, and they could answer the calls as need be. Likewise, they can transfer the calls to any user within the, the organization, it is not restricted to only the users within a particular call queue. For if HR takes a call and somebody says, hey, I've also got a laptop problem, I need to talk to the service desk, someone from HR could potentially transfer the call directly to the call queue and reach someone in the service desk department. The, there's no strict isolation be, between the two, but there is a lot of flexibility in the way that you can, can, can structure the overall approach and flow of what the advanced call handling looks like specifically within teams. Now that being said, you may start asking yourself, well, at what point would I need to look at a third party contact center? Or maybe you're already using a third party contact center today and you would need to bring that solution forward into the teams related world. While call queues and auto attendance are great, there, there is a limit to what they are capable of doing. And some of the use cases that I would put out there as um, you require a third party solution are, say you need a graphical call flow editor. The 
the Teams-based solution, while, while there is some graphics around it, you, you really would have to structure it and kind of draw it out and say Visio or on a whiteboard and then create that. That There's no graphical utility that you can use to create those call flows. If you need things like skill-based routing or maybe um, you want to offer users the ability to have the system call them back as they wait in queue, IVR workflows that maybe use something like Azure Cognitive Services based off of um, AI-based logic, CRM integration. So you have a phone number and you look up in a database, is this a customer that I know? Or you have them, you need them to input a, an account number, what they call into the system and, and find the account based off of that, that info. Again, all examples that push you towards the contact center related solutions of which there, there are several um, that, that are out there that do integrate directly with teams, either in a direct routing method or maybe at the, the calling API system method that allow you to still use teams as the call center endpoint, but have the call center solution be hosted off premises as a software as a service solution and, and keep your team's endpoint as your only telephony solution. Uh, so contact center. That's that is there. Um, and then the last thing that I really want to touch on is more around um, some of the, the E911 and life safety impacts. I, I shouldn't say the last thing, but the last technical thing I'll touch on, um, especially for US based folks. E911 is changing and it actually already has changed. Um, this would apply to uh, non US companies and organizations as well, but just in a different regulatory way. Um, there are new rules associated with E911, one of which users have to be able to directly dial 911, no pre or post digits required. Uh, central locations must be notified when an E911 call is made, and a dispatchable location must be transmitted to the emergency services operator that picks up that emergency phone call. And the reason this all came about is because there are there are two new sets of regulations. One's called Carey's Law. The other is called Ray Bombs Act. Um, Carey's Law is already in effect as of February 16th. It applies per the FCC to any multi-line telephone system, MLTS. Uh, so if you have Cisco, Shortel, Avaya, whatever the case may be, it applies to you. Um, but it also applies to Teams as well. And it really sets a national codification of how E911 has to be structured. Previously, it was all state-led. Now, Kerry's Law sets some of the standards. Ray Bombs Act is coming into play January 6th of 2021, but it works in conjunction with some of the Kerry's Law requirements. Um, so they will both be required at the national level. The existing state legislation, however, does still remain in effect. Illinois is, is one of the most stringent, uh, especially around Chicago. There are restrictions around the building and, and the floors and the square foot of user space per floor. All of that still remains in effect. It, it is not negated by any of the, any of the federal laws. So Teams from a phone system and E911 perspective does fit the bill for pretty much everything that is required per those legislations. Um, client geolocation capabilities are available. It does require you, the administrator, to do some work in order to make this happen. You do have the capability of providing centralized notifications and the ability to bridge an emergency call with, say, a security desk at the time the call occurs and somebody dials 911 for help. There is a cloud-based E911 service that you get for free included in the calling plans functionality. And for customers that are looking at direct routing solutions, you will have to provide your own because those calls go through your on-premises uh, phone system or uh, telco provider. So you'll have to make sure that whatever solutions they provide are adequate, or you can purchase a third-party solution from say West uh, which is a very common one here in the United States, uh, and provide E911 services and call routing through direct routing solutions for on-prem. So a couple of things just to point out, um, key principles to remember around E911, um, and I speak from these from experience with multiple customers and kind of a past life, never assume that a caller can, can speak to the 911 operator and tell them where their location is. Never assume emergencies occur when other users are present. 
it could happen at 8 p.m. on a, a weeknight when nobody's there. Somebody decided to stay late. Uh, never assume that people will heed your training. Uh, the scenario here is I've had several customers that have tried to convince their employees to pick up a red phone on a floor to dial 911 because that one is hard coded to a, an analog line. People will panic in emergencies and they will pick up the first phone that they have available, whether that's a Skype phone or a Teams phone or a cell phone, whatever the case may be. And lastly, never assume that cellular calling is more accurate or more reliable. Um, cell phone triangulation can be inaccurate up to 300 meters. Uh, one meter is 3.3 feet. So that is a very large radius of inaccuracy. And especially in cities with tall high rises and multiple floors, you, you are very hard pressed to get accurate triangulation based off of cell phone. So all that being said, the location capabilities in teams overcome most of these issues uh, and in enable you to identify exactly where the user is based off of your corporate configuration. So the way this all works, uh, dynamic location awareness is based off of a, a couple different sets of principles in Teams. Um, first and foremost is the, the location of your civic addresses, so the buildings that you operate in, and then ERLs, which are known as emergency response locations, are things like floors within the building. And then Office 365 also requires you to say, hey, these are my public IP addresses that my team's clients will come from. And if all that aligns, you have these emergency calling configuration policies that allow you to um, structure and identify how emergency calls route and who gets alerted. So an example of this, I live in Nashville, Tennessee, so this is a, a, a great example for me. Um, there is a building in downtown National, which is known here as the Batman building, the, the two spires on either side. It's an AT&T building. There's roughly 30-ish floors, uh, and it resides at 333 Commerce Street. But say for a moment, you are an organization that has multiple locations in that building. Say floor 21 was your original one. That's where your phone system lines come in. But then you had to expand, and now you're down on floor 11, but you're in a specific suite on floor 11. You don't have the full, the full floor. So if you use some of these location features within Teams, uh, you can do things like identify your subnets and your wireless access points such that if my client is connected to a wireless access point on floor 11, if I were to actually dial 911, the emergency dispatcher would actually see my floor, the suite info, and the address on that 911 call. That is your ultimate end goal, such that if that person can't talk, whether because they're having a heart attack or maybe it's they can't speak for being uh, injured, it provides rescuers an immediate dispatchable location to go. They don't have to ask directions when they get to the floor building, the, the first floor of the building. They don't have to talk to security. They don't have to talk to anybody in the office. They can simply know exactly where to go, and that should be your goal in, in all this. So the end user experience for this actually looks like this. When you dial 911, you will see the, the red bang there on the left-hand side, and it will show down here in the bottom where your location is. If you have actually set up in the calling configuration that, say, a, uh, a, a service, uh, a security desk needs to be identified and simultaneously conferenced into the call, you will see the second call pane on the right-hand side. And everything that you say to the emergency dispatcher, whoever is on the other end of that call on the right-hand side, they will hear as well. And, and they can talk in real time. Um, that way, they are immediately made aware of any ongoing emergencies for that particular location. Additionally, you will get an instant messaging alert for any emergency call that has an applicable policy for it and it will say who the person was and where they were, and it is configurable as to who receives this alert. So this could be your receptionist, it could be a life safety person um, that is on, on your staff, or it could potentially include someone that is not even on the floor. Um, maybe you have a security guard in security shack and they have the team's client running in a browser. 
um, they could receive this alert as well. So all things around the, the employee life safety and kind of E911 experience, things to think about. Um, you got a lot of options and, and Teams is definitely there to meet them. Lastly, I just want to touch real quick on some of the licensing uh, implications around this. And I've got a couple use cases that will hopefully kind of make sense of the madness. So if you are a customer today using E3 or M3, um, you get this white box at the top. So you know the core E3 license gives you Teams, SharePoint, OneDrive for Business, Exchange Online, and some of the other um, availability of features in, in Office 365. But as you start to work through your work, your use cases, say one of your use cases is I need I need dial in numbers for my meetings. OK, that use case is going to require at a minimum the audio conferencing dial in capability, which is the audio conferencing license and it's MSRP four dollars per user per month. That gets you told numbers. Say you need toll free. OK, we can do toll free. However, Toll-free audio conferencing requires a, a license called communications credits. It's kind of a family share plan within your Office 365 tenant, um, but toll-free would require that at the tenant level. Okay, say your use cases, I have Cisco video endpoints that I need to use with Teams. All right, that's fine. Cloud video interop is the solution for that. Um, I've given the PECSIP licensing here the other solutions, the licensing will vary because they all have different licensing, but there's the there's the PECSIP cost associated with that. Uh, $900 for your domain and then $2,500 per call per year. Um, they work off of a concurrency based model. So you want phone system calling capabilities for teams. OK, the phone system is an add on capability that you can get. It's $8 per user per month. And then if you want to go full off net, no direct routing, you would need a calling plan as well, which is one of the domestic calling plans or international calling plans. Uh, but you would need both for a calling plan deployment. And if you have meeting rooms, so, so you do want to deploy some of these meeting teams, meeting room systems, there is a dedicated SKU explicitly for, for, for meeting room devices that is cheaper than purchasing the E3 app capabilities and assigning it to the room system account. Uh, it's kind of an all-in-one thing. But if you do still need to make phone calls from that system, you would also need the calling plan. I just didn't uh, throw there and keep the badness in line. And then things like common area phones, so lobby phones, hallway phones, um, phones that are not in conference rooms that are scattered throughout your, your organization. That is also something you would have to license. There is a common area phone license. And again, if those phones need external calling capabilities, you would need on on top of that. So those are some of the E3 license cases. And then lastly, E5. So the ad advantage with E5 is that now audio conferencing and phone system is already bundled in the solution. So you don't have to add those on as a, a separate add on to an E3 license. Um, so if you need dial in, you've already got toll dial, dial in as a part of the, the core E5 license. The only reason you would need communications credits is if you still need toll free dial in for your meetings. So again, same licensing as before. Uh, Cisco video endpoints, again, same license as before. That would be an add on for the cloud video interop license. Uh, calling plans in this particular use case if you don't need calling plans and you go the route of using direct routing, you do not need any additional licensing because you already have the phone system license included as a part of the core E5. The only reason you would need calling plans is if you're not going the direct routing route. And lastly, same structure for meeting rooms. Um, if you deploy them and you're not going to go the direct routing route, you would still need that calling plan add-on. Otherwise, you could simply have the meeting room license and use direct routing free of charge. And same thing for common area phone. Again, same, same kind of structure. Um, as long as you're using direct routing, there would be no need for additional calling plan licenses. Uh, otherwise, simply add the calling plan, domestic or international, and away you go. So all that being said, I covered a lot of stuff. 
And I'm at the end of my deck, even though I had more content, but I pulled it out. So are there any questions, any comments, things that I can help clarify before, before we let you go? Or yeah, before this I go, great, rather? Trevor. Um, I would ask the audience either raise your hand right now or enter your questions in the chat. I realized that we addressed a lot of them in a line as they were coming up, but yeah, th this has been awesome, very informative. And I would even say to you, Trevor, like as a beginning question, what is the most common thing that people kind of misconstrue or kind of misunderstand about meetings? I know you um, laid it out pretty well as far as you know, a channel meeting versus a private meeting versus a live meeting all the way to the end or live event. But what do you find is the common misconception with meetings? Uh, I would say there's, there is some misconception, especially with customers that maybe don't have all of the prerequisites. Um, Exchange online is a big one. Um, but in general, most people tend to stick with private meetings just because it's what they know, it's what they love, that's what they're used to. Um, the channel meetings, though, th there are definitely some benefits there and, and some automation to be have. It, it really does make your life easier that you don't have to manage invitees on a neat, endless basis. <laughs> so um, uh, channel meetings are, are going to be something that I feel really has some explosive growth now that things are... Uh, now that things are coming on. But yeah, bit, teams in general, um, if anybody hasn't said it before, I'll say it now, uh, really requires your mailbox to be in Exchange Online. It can work with Exchange on-premises, but there's a bunch of limitations there. Right. Things just work better when you have everything ready in the cloud. Absolutely, and you really don't want to offer a you know, limited or hampered um, experience for your users as you're indicating. You got it. All right. I think that's going to wrap us up for Trevor's session. Okay. We're going, thanks a lot for your time and the information. Yep. This has been great.